Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today's Bible reading is taken from Ephesians 6, chapters 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be, be able to withstand on the evil day, and having prevailed against everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and belt your waist with truth, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, and lace up your sandals in preparation for the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very, very, very much, Tim, for reading that for us this morning. It's the very last bit in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And I feel like if we're going to say one thing to the church, kind of, but this whole letter is this last bit stand firm, just stand firm. Now, I quite like the armour of God, it's a pretty cool thing. And when I was 18 years old, when I first became a Christian, when I first gave my life to Jesus and I bought a Bible and I decided to read through the New Testament, it was the first passage that I memorised. The armour of God. That helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes fitted for the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. The shield of faith with which to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And, I had, and whenever I felt down or low, whenever I felt depressed or hurt, I would pray on that armour of God. It's just very easy to remember. Now, you will try to do it, this is a slightly different order to it is in Paul, but I'll explain uh, why in a minute. But I, it's just easier to remember if I start at the top of my head, the helmets of salvation will work my way down, but I can remember all the bits and the six pieces. And I pray that. I pray that. But it's probably true to say that I didn't really know what the different bits were. I just knew that I wanted God's protection out there in the world as a young fellow. Who would have thought that perhaps uh, 10 years later I would be preaching <laughs> on that very subject? <laughs> I missed that. Yeah. Okay, 36 or something years later. I'd be preaching on that same subject here at St. Mark's. And what's interesting is that this Bible passage, this uh, passage from Paul, is not just written to individuals. It's importantly, as, as you will see, it's written to the church, to the whole church. But stepping back a little bit, we need to understand that there's evil in the world. Now, you might think, well, yeah, of course, we know there's evil in the world. But we have, we seem to have a little problem with understanding that there is God and that there is love in the world. That there's somehow a consciousness behind love. There's a consciousness behind good. But there's a consciousness behind evil too. There's a mind behind it, if you will. And whatever a word you want to use for that, Satan, the devil, that there's a consciousness behind it. That actually, there's a cosmic battle going on, as Jesus would put it. And if you think about what Jesus did, he came to confront evil wherever he went. And there's this cosmic pattern going on. If you like, evil tries to drag us towards destruction. And good and love, God is love, 
is trying to woo us, if you will, draw us into love and redemption and peace and restoration. And there's this battle going on. And it seems to me that if you, if you don't take one side or the other, if you just kind of drift, then you sort of flow in one direction. It doesn't seem to be the natural direction to kind of flow towards love in a way, if left to our own devices. Maybe uh, there's always going to be countries for the rule, but it seems that humanity, when left to our own devices, when we just do our own thing, we seem to drift the other way. We seem to drift into the need for power and the need to take stuff from other people. We seem to drift into trashing our environment, we're wasting resources. You know what I mean? It doesn't seem to be that if we just stay still, if we don't take a side, that we kind of drift the other way. It's not that we become more sustainable and ecological and more caring of our environment, is it? Naturally, it seems that we flow the other way. And it reminds me of when I'm on John Smith's beach down here and I'm swimming. And say swimming, I paddle basically, I just float. <laughs> Helen swim, she's kind of plowing in there. And I'm just staying there, I'm just kind of chatting away. And you turn around and you realise you're, you're 20 yards down the beach or 50 yards down the beach because the tide has just been great. You look back at the truck and think, I'm not where I was. I've moved. And it's a bit like that. I think that somehow when we are not aware of that kind of pull of evil in the world, and if it's your first time to start, don't, write, don't, don't preach the devil and the evil every week. But <laughs> it just seems to me that when we just stay still, we're not actually staying still, are we? We seem to drift in that direction. It's very easy to go with the flow of culture. And culture seems to take us in that direction. And it seems to be a conscious effort not to buy plastic bottles whenever I buy something. Maybe I have to think, no, no, maybe I can refill a bottle. Rather than the natural things, because I'm going to go and buy a case of plastic bottles, why not? Realise they're just going to get burned or thrown or buried in the most. You know, it's the flow, if you will, it's in that direction. So, what is Paul writing here? What is he writing here? He says there's this cosmic battle going on, you can't stay still. But he's writing to the church. See, the armour of God that he's describing here, these pieces of armour that we wear, they're not for us just as individuals. They are for us as the church. And when we read about the armour of God, when we read about this, and it's just a metaphor, he's not saying we're literally to be soldiers. He's just using it as a metaphor. You see, when we, when we don that armour, when we, when we ask for that protection, when we start to be the people that God has called us into, to be in the world, we do it collectively. He's writing to the whole church. And, it, and he's, as he's describing a Roman centurion and the, what a Roman centurion would wear, we have to remember that Roman centurion would never be on their own. They would never try and do anything in their own strength. No, they're part of an army. That's what made the Roman army so strong. It's because they, they were together. And so he's writing this and saying, hey, no, together you put on the armour of God. Together you are this team, these, these, these ambassadors for God in the world. This is what I want you to be. It reminds me of those shoals of fish. You see in those TV shows, um, those underwater, they've got the, the big bait ball, yeah, and they've got the dolphins picking, trying to pick them off. It's the ones that swim off on their own who get picked off first, yeah. It's that same kind of analogy. We, we can't do this thing on our own. If we try to, we get picked off, we get and we need to be together in the same. Often people say to me, well, you don't, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian, do you? I mean, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. I hear that all the time. I think, well, technically, I guess. You know? But if you're not part of the church, how can you be the people of God that God has called us to be together, to bring this change in the world, to be this light, this salt, and this love? God has called us to be, to be that yeast that works through the dough, as Jesus put it. How can the love of God spread God? How can we be the influencers that God has called us to be? We just try and fight valiantly on our own, do our own little thing. It doesn't work like that. We're not meant to do this thing called life on our own. We're not meant to be ambassadors for Christ on our own. We are supposed to be together and be strong together. If there's one message or one thing you take away from what I'm saying today, it's that we're in this thing together. We are a family together. And when we look at St. Mark's, and St. Mark's is obviously the best church in the world ever. 
my mind up all day. It is. When I think about this church, St. Mark's, this is what I see. It's this amazing group of people working together for God's purposes in the world. And Paul says to the church, hey, put on the armor of God. Wear the helmet of salvation. He actually starts with the belt of truth, and I'll come on to that in a minute. I'm going to do it that way, because I can remember it now. The hell is salvation. Protect your minds. You see, what you think matters. As Christians, we are thinking people. We're not blind followers. We're not unthinking people. We're supposed to use our consciousness, our rationality, as we go out in the world. We're supposed to protect our minds. What we think matters and what we think about salvation. Why the hell is salvation? Salvation isn't something that happens to us. Salvation is a process. Paul in that same letter, he I was being saved, I am being saved, but I will be saved. Salvation is a process. Or another way of thinking about it, say thinking about it, is that salvation is a series of ongoing decisions that you make, of rational decisions that you make to choose to live in the way of coins, to live out your salvation. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. This is always an example that pops to my mind. And he'd be diddling people, he'd be conning people. And when he met Jesus, he said, Do you know what? I'm going to give, I'm going to pay back everybody that I'm going to give them extra. And I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. And what Jesus said, he said, Get it. Oh, you don't actually say get it, that's me. <laughs> Paraphrase. He said, get it. Yes. He said, today salvation has come to this house. He wasn't saying that Jesus was going to go to heaven one day when he died. He said, no, 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 no. He's living it out and out. He's starting to be one of the people of God that I have called him to be in the world. So make a difference. He's exactly started loving the poor. He started loving the people that he had conned in the past. His life was turned, he turned around. He made a conscious decision. We need, collectively, to wear that helmet of salvation, to think, protect our minds, and keep making those decisions for God. What we think matters. What we feel matters. And Joanne will be nodding to that one, right? What we feel matters. It really matters, and it matters to God. It's important. What we feel matters. And so we wear, collectively, the breastplate of righteousness. Not that we try and be super holy and godlike, like me, of course. <laughs> Heaven forbid. No, we're righteous because of what Jesus has done for us. We remind each other that we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You are righteous and holy before God because of what Jesus has done. What you think about yourself matters. You are more precious and more beloved, as we say in our promises here, than you can possibly imagine. You are a holy people. That's how God sees you. The righteousness that comes from God, there's nothing you can do to earn it. You don't deserve it, I don't deserve it. God knows what we said last night or did the other day. He knows it. He still says, hey, don't worry, you're righteous. And we remind ourselves collectively that it matters what we feel. And then we have the belt of truth buckled around our waist. I think that that is what we believe, or our knowledge about the world, or how we see the world. And actually, Paul starts with that because everything stems from that. Step away from everything else. What you, how you see the world, your worldview matters. And we need to gain a, a correct worldview. Do you believe that actually everybody? is inherently bad, born a sinner? Or do you believe that everybody is inherently good because they're created in the image of God and God said when, he, when God created it's You didn't say it's good, he said it's very good. You see, how you see the world, how you understand it, it matters. What you believe matters. And so, you'll hear me from the front saying, hey, so this is what, this is the perspective, the world view we should have. Because it underpins everything. And the belt on a centurion's armour would help everything together. It underpins everything. And then our feet fitted with the shoes. We've got the shoes of peace. The readiness actually that comes with the gospel of peace. In other words, we're supposed to be a journey. Our journey matters. Our thoughts matter. Our feelings matter. Our belief matters. But our journey matters. We're not called to be static ornaments or passive bystanders. 
We're called to be bringers of peace in the world. I think if Paul was around today, he'd be saying, put on your Air Jordans, or whatever it is that the coolest drinkers are at the moment. I don't have a cool drink. I'm not cool, so I don't have drinks. Yeah? If you say, what are the coolest things? Yeah? Put those on, because you're going to need them. Your journey matters. You're going to be people that bring God's peace. To bind up the broken hearted. To bring to healing and wholeness those that are hurting. To be family to the lonely and the marginalized and the bereaved. To look after God's creation. To honor it. It's precious. And to live sustainably as best you can. This is our calling. We're not called to just stay still. Sometimes think, we have such an individualistic culture, don't we? That's our culture. It wasn't like that 2,000 years ago. When Paul was writing this letter, he was writing it to community. And people thought of themselves not just as individuals, but as community. In our culture, it's the opposite way around. You'll hear preachers say, have you, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Are you personally saved? And the letters of Paul remind us that he's writing to the church collectively. Collectively, you are to be bringers of God's peace in your workplaces, in your families, your homes, in the school, in the environment out there. And second of all, it's the shield of faith. Now, faith is different to believing stuff, having the knowledge of truth. Having faith is leaning into Christ, it's standing firm and saying, you know what? We're going to trust that this stuff is true. We're going to trust it's true. We're going to lean into Jesus Christ. We're going to stand in faith together. And if you know anything about shields and armies, the shields are what they used to protect each other with. They used to they move forward with shields together. And if somebody tripped and fell, they cover them with faith. That's how they're meant to be. As a church family, if somebody's tripping up or struggling, somebody else has enough faith for them, they cover them with a shield. And that shield of faith extinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one. Because the world is a tough place, we'll get some flaming arrows flung at us for sure. And finally, the only kind of non protective thing, I guess, is that sword of the Spirit, the Word of God that we wield. And I love this. The sword of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit lives in each of us. If we become a Christian, God makes home in us. The Holy Spirit's in us. Again, not to be static, not to be still. And when Paul says the Word of God, he doesn't mean the Bible. Because there are two words for the Word. <laughs> They're confusing now, there are two words for the Word. There's Logos, which means the kind of written Word. And Rhema, and he says Rhema. Be the Rhema of God, which means the applied Word of God. The practical outworked word of God in the world. And who is the word of God? In the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was with God. Who is the word of God? And there's, whenever a pastor asks you a question, it's always only a one answer, right? Jesus. Hey, good job, Jesus. Some of you think, I don't know. <laughs> the word of God is Jesus. We are called to be Jesus to the world. That's what it means to be an outworking of the Word of God, as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus lives in us, we are called to wield what? Not destruction or death, but the love. You are called to be wielders of love in the world, to be Jesus to the world. Not on your own, but collectively, as a church. And as, when Paul finishes all these things, he says, clothe yourself, basically, in love. And clothe yourself in love by doing what? By Praying. Be a praying people. How do you know how to make the right decisions in life? How do you know what we should be feeling? How do we know what to believe? How do we, how do we know where we're supposed to be going? How do we know how to have faith or to be like Jesus? It's through prayer. Prayer is not just sitting there asking for things the whole time. The one thing we should be asking, I suppose, is what is your will and purpose? It's prayer is aligning ourselves with the Holy Spirit in us. To see the world with God's eyes, to see people as God sees them, to see the environment as God sees it. And then to collectively to go and be and feel and think like Jesus. To be the hands of Jesus, to be the feet of Jesus, to be the voice of Jesus in the world. 
when one of us falls, pick them up. When one of us struggles and what they're feeling, we say, you're righteous, because God has made you holy. When somebody struggles with what they're thinking, we say, hey, it's okay. God's got you. We've got you together. That's the best thing about St. Mark's, by far, is our church family. I was going to say the preaching, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the music. The yeah. best thing is our church family. I am so proud to be part of this church family that picks each other up, looks out for each other, and not just that, does it out there in the world. Every time I hear of stories of what you guys are doing, it just fills my heart with love and pride and a good, good pride. <laughs> because it is such a great church sometimes. I love it, what we're doing. But then sometimes we need that backup and support, as you know. And this is my little appeal. I'm going to do a little appeal today. Because every week I stick my head above the parapet, don't I, when I write in the Royal Gazette. Now, it goes out online. I can tell you that the comments I, that people post online are all pretty nasty. People, when they write to me personally, it's usually the way around. Thank you so much for writing that. It spoke to me. In. And, it's, and, it's, and, and I'm not writing in the Royal Gazette every week to get come up with a problem in the Royal Gazette. Oh, no, great. No, it's to reach people with God's love and to encourage them in their walk with Jesus wherever they are, whether they're a million miles away from God or whether they've, they've been a Christian their entire lives. It's just trying to do something good. But I tell you what, people take pop shots at me every week. You read go online and read the comments. Sometimes they're quite, they're, they're just pretty nasty. And of course they're all anonymous, aren't they? Yeah. Because people won't put their name to it. I would love it. And I've been doing it for three years now. I'm really thick skin, don't worry. But wouldn't it be amazing if, if you could stand with me and be my shield? Get online, sign up to discuss, or use your Google login, or whatever it is, and just write something. If somebody's posting something nasty, counter it with love. Don't, don't, don't have to get into an argument, have a lamp, ask them, don't even do that. Just, just, just be there in love. That would be amazing. Because that's what we do together. That's my own personal appeal today. Because Paul says, do you know what? Stand. If you notice in that Bible, he says it three times. So you, you may stand, you may stand, 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 together. We are a family, best church in the world ever. We must stand together. May you know God will do this week. May you know his blessing. May you be Jesus. Who is God calling you to be Jesus to? Where is God calling you to go? If you need prayer, reach out. If you need support, reach out. Because we're here for one another. We collectively are wearing the armor of God for each other and for the world. Because there's an awful lot of stake, isn't there? Amen? Amen.